collagen, it's a protein and a pretty cool one at that. Due to its structure, it possesses many functions within the body that exploits its strength, firmness and elasticity. Collagen is found in your skin, cartilage, tendons, ligaments, blood vessels, eyes and well, many parts of the body as collagen is one of the most abundant proteins in the body. And along with its abundance in our bodies, there is a growing abundance of research papers on collagen, one of which we'll discuss today, a new collagen replacement therapy that was applied to the skin of mice and improved long-term treatment of photo-aged skin. So first we'll look in more detail at both the structure of collagen and where it is found in the skin, and then I'll show the methods used in this paper to deliver collagen and the data they present showing whether it worked, and then we'll have a discussion. So let's take a look at the skin. Collagen was recently estimated to make up 20 to 40% of protein in the skin, and the skin's important. People may simply think about skin for aesthetic reasons, but skin is more than just aesthetics. It's a barrier. It protects our insides from the outsides, which contain pathogens and chemicals. And it's also a medium of communication with the environment, touch. So our skin is a warrior. And other threats to the skin include damage by UV irradiation that can cause photoaging, where the skin prematurely ages and becomes fragile. Amongst many things, this is characterised by loss of collagen. For the purposes of this video then, we need to appreciate the role of collagen in the skin. So where is it? Well, the skin can be split up into three main layers, the epidermis, the outer layer that is composed of many layers of cells, the dermis, where you can find fibroblasts, blood vessels, nerve fibres, and the extracellular matrix, and then beneath it is the hypodermis. The hypodermis contains more blood vessels and fat cells. Type 1 collagen is primarily found in the dermis, where it aids in building a fibrillary structure within the extracellular matrix that allows cell adhesion and migration through the matrix. This figure shows a cell embedded in the matrix of the dermis. It also provides support and tensile strength. So just to clarify, there are many different types of collagen. Type 1 collagen, as I just said, builds a fibrillary structure and is found in the dermis of the skin. You go from one protein chain of type 1 collagen, the so-called alpha chain, and three of these alpha chains can come together to form a triple helix, and then these helices then align and cross-link to form fibrils, so you get strength in numbers. And it's type 1 collagen that is commonly seen to get depleted following photoaging. So a potential solution to mitigate against this is collagen replacement therapy. Now, what you are probably most familiar with at the moment are collagen protein powders that you can consume. I've not looked into the effectiveness of these powders in this video, but let me know at any point if you would like to do, for me to do that, because instead we're going to focus on the latest new technology, delivering collagen mRNA directly into the skin, as explained in this recent paper. So it's a form of gene therapy, and this does not just to prove if this delivery modality works, but if it does, it could offer a longer term solution and a more effective way for controlling skin aging. So for their cargo then, they opted for the mRNA of Col1A1. This is read by the cell to make alpha-1 type 1 collagen, so this type 1 collagen that encodes pro-alpha chains that as we just saw can be combined with other alpha chains to form a triple helix that can then go on to form these fibrils. So the mRNA is that intermediate between the gene that's encoded in DNA and the final protein, which in this case is the type 1 collagen. So then the second question is, how are they going to deliver this collagen into the dermis of the skin? And then how would they test if it was effective? Well, there are a couple of characteristics that you would look for. For in vivo gene delivery, so gene delivery here being the mRNA, you would need the vehicle to be large enough to carry the cargo, in this case, the mRNA for Col1A1. And you'd want the cargo to be efficiently taken up by the cells and for the mRNA to get expressed, so going from the collagen mRNA to collagen protein. And you would want this all to happen without causing some immune response or toxicity. The two methods compared in this paper are extracellular fascicles and lipid nanoparticles. Now, we could have a whole conversation about how I should be saying fascicles or fesicles, so I'll just save some time and call them EVs from now on. And these UVs have emerged recently as promising carriers for genes in the form of mRNA as they are naturally secreted by cells and are therefore biocompatible 
and have proteins already present at their membrane that could facilitate uptake into the cells of interest, and are also big enough to carry the cargo. The actual challenge with EVs is generating enough of them from cell lines, and secondly, deciding when to add the collagen mRNA. Handily though, the team behind this recent paper previously developed an approach that enabled them to incorporate a high abundance of mRNAs into their EVs called cellular nanoporation. Great. And so the other method are lipid nanoparticles. These nanoparticles can be artificially generated and are lipid nanoparticles. <laughs> so that's what it is. And many of you are probably already somewhat familiar with the technology because it was used by Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech for the COVID vaccines. And so LMPs, these lipid nanoparticles, are easier to manufacture and standardise. Plus, unlike the EVs, it's known pretty much what's inside of them because you're making them yourself. They don't come from cells that could be doing various things. So we have EVs and we have LMPs, both loaded with mRNA for coal 1A1. But which, which one is better? better? There's, There's only, only one way, way to, to find, find out. out. I'm joking, but we did need to have a model to test if their system was working. So the model system that they used in this paper was to photo-age the skin of mice. And this has been done previously and done in this paper by basically UV irradiating the skin. And has previously been shown to deplete collagen in the tissue and to reduce the thickness of the dermal layer. And then they wanted to assess the therapeutic potential of these collagen EVs and also the LMPs. And so they did that and they also had a look as controls, empty EVs and empty lipid nanoparticles. And they also took a look at retinoic acid topical treatment, as well as having their, their negative saline control. So if we look at the saline control first, we can see that there was an increase in the number of wrinkles following this treatment with UV irradiation, showing that the skin had indeed been photo-aged. Sorry, I probably should have pre-warned about the number of mouse backsides you're about to see. <laughs> um, but regarding the therapeutic approaches, you can see here that the EV with coal 1A1 performed best in terms of reduction in wrinkles, but the LMPs were also effective. And both approaches demonstrated higher elasticity and firmness following the UV irradiation. But mice delivered the LMPs showed redness and swelling, while the EVs did not exhibit a strong inflammatory reaction. So it looked like the EVs were for the win. But not yet, as the effect bore off after a month, as the wrinkles reappeared. So to enhance the long-term reduction in wrinkles, the authors modified their delivery to use microneedles designed to improve the duration of protein replacement. So they designed a hyaluronic acid microneedle EV formulation. These patches they made were pressed onto the back skin of the mice and it dissolved into the tissue without visible skin irritation. And it was the best strategy they found for recovery after photo-aging the skin. It substantially reduced wrinkle number up to 70 days. But it's as above me mentioning here before I forget that they did do this in athymic mice with an inhibited immune system. What the immune response would be in a mice with thymuses, I'm not entirely sure. But anyhow, the authors conclude the intradermal delivery of EV-based coal 1A1 mRNA may make for an effective protein replacement therapy for the treatment of photo-aged skin. There are a few things worth discussing before we end though. Firstly, EVs without the coal 1A1 mRNA actually achieved a modest decline in wrinkle number, and that's likely because these empty EVs are, well, they're not really empty, as they contain content that originally came from the source cells. What these endogenous cargoes are is not only interesting, but probably important to find out, since otherwise they don't know 100% what they're giving to the mice. And this would be very important if this approach was going to be translated to human therapies. And speaking of human therapeutics, using this approach, the author states, although many challenges would need to be overcome before the microneedle-based EV delivery system could be tried in humans, because of the improved biocompatibility and benign side effect profile of EVs as compared with LMPs and adeno-associated viruses, we believe that the system might constitute a universal nucleic acid carrier for the treatment of a range of human diseases and conditions. Moreover, the coal 1A1 mRNA when in these EVs was stable at room temperature, also making it amenable to clinical utility. But it is important for me to reiterate that this delivery modality shown in the paper is not the same as taking collagen as a supplement. 
What happens when following oral consumption is not something I've actually looked into yet. So to conclude, EVs, these extracellular fascicles, seem like a promising technology to keep an eye on. But right now, you should put your eye on this video YouTube recommends for you. With that, I hope you've learned something in this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.